a look at the work of Gary Winogrand. So as usual, here is a little bit about Gary Winogrand. And here is the video I'm going to show uh, right now about Gary Winogrand. So if you want to read about him, Gary Winogrand is dead. He died in 1984. Um, very influential uh, street photo. And I'll probably stop the video a couple of times as we go. Who uh, I feel learn the most from, most immediately. Uh, who, the volume on this video is a little low, so I'm gonna. Hopefully, you can hear it. Uh, I feel most responsible to Walker Evans and Robin Frank. In fact, let me do this. Let me go back to the beginning. So, if you are having trouble hearing it, uh, you can read the bottom part. The closed captioning. I think the photographers who uh, I feel that I learned the most from, most immediately, uh, who uh, I feel most responsible to, are Walker Evans and Robert Frank. Like Frank, Winogrand primarily photographs people on the beach in Santa Monica, on the streets of Hollywood, all over the country. He currently lives in Los Angeles, but it won't be long before he feels driven to head for another town in another state. So you can see he's actually in Venice Beach. This is several years ago. I, I don't know, probably 30 years ago now or, or something like that. He's older, so it's, it's closer to the end of his life. Gary Winogrand's an interesting character in that um, He's a street photographer who just went out every day with his camera and photographed things all day long. And, and you know, if, if you think about how he was photographing, if, if you had a camera to your eye all day long and simply photographed everything you saw, there would be some interesting photographs in there. So that was sort of his, the way he did it, you know, in, in digital now, people refer to it as spray and pray, where you just shoot thousands of images and then you come back and you find the good ones. He was doing it with film, which makes it more difficult. And, and you'll see some of this as it comes up in his videos. But he was interesting in that, I forget the number, maybe they'll say it in here. When he died, he had about, uh, I don't know whether it was, a couple thousand rolls or, but a huge number of, of rolls of film that had yet to be processed, that he had shot, that he just hadn't developed. And again, this is, he's shooting film, so they had to go through a chemical process and it's a whole other thing. If any of you wanna work that way, I teach the darkroom class at Rio Hondo when we, when we go back. If you want to know how film works and, and go through the darkroom process, we can take that class and I'd love to have you there. Um, but he's working with film. So uh, uh, let me go through this a little bit and then I'll come back and talk more about it. Winogrand doesn't want to have the multifaceted way he tackles reality pinned down in categories. I, I hate the term. I think it's a stupid term, street photography. I don't think it, it makes any, it tells you anything about a photographer or work in a way. Um, Winogrand maintains that the problem. So notice he's just out with his camera. As he sees people doing something or coming along, he goes and he, he sort of shoots. Now, does he hold the camera up to his eye the whole time? No, and, and that's part of what his, when we look at his images, you'll see he's sort of known for this sort of uh, angled horizon lines and, and things like that. But he's out there with his camera and he's put himself in a position to, to, to find things as they're coming at him and looking at how to sort of look at that. And, and so I want you to hear what he has to say about that. Photography doesn't consist of taking a pretty picture. It's to find a way to transform the real world into something completely different, into a distinct image. Uh, Oh, 
also what's in so i know i keep stopping this but what was interesting about that interaction is that guy was staring at him and gary winogrand knew that gary winogrand does not want to engage people he's very much of that candid school so cartier brisson people on the street are often of that fly on the wall god's eye perspective where you know you're trying not to engage the people you're trying to get people in their sort of natural state. Now, sometimes they're staring at you and they give you dirty looks and stuff like that. And those make for interesting photographs too, but you're not collaborating with them. They're not choosing to pose for you. Whereas the Diane Arbus photographs, you know, Diane Arbus and the guy we'll see next, Dash Snow, Diane Arbus very much engaged the people she was photographing. She didn't want to sort of catch them in the act. She wanted to have them be part of creating the photograph. So, you know, there's different ways of working, but watch Gary Winogrand. He works very much as a sort of non-interaction person. He's, he's may talk to the people or he may say something, but he's not, he doesn't want posed. He doesn't want a sort of awareness of the photograph. <laughs> On the subject, I, mean, I, call, I, I have a book out called The Animals. Call me a Zephyr Zoo photographer. I mean, this only don't make any sense to me, you know. So, you know, people keep saying, well, what makes that photograph interesting or not? You know, what I love about this photograph is. It's this house, right? So it's probably a housing track or something like that. And you have to remember at the time um, that he's photographing this. I don't know when this one's from the 50s, maybe the 60s, could be the 70s. But, you know, tract homes are being built. So this big open land that all of a sudden developer comes and builds a, a series of houses. And what I love about this one is, you know, you see this young kid. So here, but this house just ends and, and nature starts again. You know, it's like, oh, concrete back to nothing. And it is that dividing line between, you know, where the sort of man's intervention back to, to nature. You know, the last one with the horse, it was that moment of, of sort of chaos of the horse sort of looking at the camera of the guy, you know, it is that moment, that decisive moment that takes place in his photographs. Again, you see the guy staring at the camera. You know, what makes this is that broken nose, right? So obviously he looks kind of like a fighter or something like that. Again, panning with the camera. That's why he's kind of in focus, but the whole background's going out of focus. But he has that sort of tough guy look that he's even given, you know, the photographer here, Gary Winogrand. But, you know, somebody it, it appears, I don't know, maybe he had a nose job, whatever, but it looks like somebody's already punched him in the nose. You know, this is how he goes through life in this convertible with this woman who just not staring at anybody who doesn't look that happy, you know, so all of those elements coming together in those photographs. You know, your photographer is responsible for two things. Once you, you put your body where you want it to be, uh, what's in the frame and when you snap the shutter, that's what you, that's what, the photographer does. The camera does the rest. You know, you get what the camera saw. And you are responsible for what's in the frame, what's in the edges, and when the shutter is snapped. Okay. You know, and, and his photos deal a lot with this sort of odd juxtaposition. Like he loves to photograph, I shouldn't say he loves, I don't know whether he loves it or not. There's a lot of interesting photographs he was made of people photographing other things. You know, it is that idea then of you know, what people are choosing to photograph and how they're going about it. One of my favorite images of him, and I hope it's in the images that I'll show you here in a few minutes, is, um, I guess it's a Cape Canaveral or whatever, and there's a rocket being launched. And everybody is watching this rocket. And it's this moment that the rocket's going up and the smoke's coming out of it. And, the, and everybody is looking this way. There is one woman looking back the other way with a camera up to her face. And that is the photo that he's taken and you just have to go this thing is going on everybody is watching this rocket blast off what is she photographing what what is more interesting than that and that is the interesting part of that photograph he photographs you know 
JFK giving a speech from, from behind where you see, you just see the back of JFK talking to the audience, but then on the TV monitor, you see what that audience is seeing. So it's that back and forth of, of what's happening behind the scenes versus what's in the photo. And you see that play out a lot. I try photos. to frame in terms of what I want to include. I don't think about pictures, but I'm fine. My photo, I say life. That's all there is. I, you know, I mean, in my view, fine. It's not a picture there. You're not a picture. We know too much about how photographs look, or pictures look. And it's the easiest thing in the world. What to, to, it's natural to make those pictures we know. It's boring. You don't learn anything that way. You keep making what you know. So I, don't, I try to deal with things. I, I've worked out my own way, I, I guess, to uh, contend with that problem of being programmed about knowing, knowing too much about pictures, you see. Suddenly a scene like a picture by Winogrand. And one of the most significant photographers of our time sees himself in a situation that has probably annoyed every photo amateur at one time or another. Photographing often enough, somebody will come up to me and ask, "Say you're getting you're getting good pictures," and I don't know. I know that what I photograph is interesting. Uh, I haven't seen the pictures yet. You know, um, if, uh, well, the, hopefully the picture will be more interesting than what I photograph. And if it isn't that, it doesn't work. So. Like an image like this, it's the juxtaposition of this guy, you know, these women, attractive women dressed up, you know, walking down the street. And then you have this guy in the wheelchair sort of, I don't know whether he's passed out or, or what's happening, but that look, you know, the, between them, you know, it's that juxtaposition of things, of people, of events happening, those sort of moments. Um, Gary Winogrand shoots photos as if he wanted to absorb reality within himself. For him, photography is like a drug he needs to have daily. And I, the way I would put it is I get totally out of myself. I mean, it's the closest I come to not existing, I think. <laughs> which is the best thing, which I, to me is attractive anyway. Okay, so that was a little bit about Gary Winogrand, that video there. Let me. Uh... Let me go here to these images. Uh, again, a little bit more about him, but here is an archive of some images of his if you want to see them. Um, and to take a look, let me see if I can find the one that I wanted to talk about. He is a little creepy in that he photographed a lot of women on the street, but you know, uh, I don't know what to say about that. Where's that other image that I wanted? All right. Uh, oh, I know. I may come back to him and show some other images of his 
uh, later on. Uh, where are we at? 1230. I want to go back now because I want to talk more about street photo and sort of more of a contemporary approach to it. And uh, the person I'm going to show you now, Dash Snow, is sort of an interesting character. Uh, he's also dead, but much younger. Uh, so here's Dash Snow. I should tell you that here's a little bit about him. Uh, again, I assume you're all adults. There will be some images here that you might find <sighs> objectionable. There may be some nudity and, and things like that in it. So um, actually, you know, you can read a little bit about um, these images here or about Dash Snow. There is a, another video about him that's more about his life. Um, but what Dash Snow is doing is he's photographing the people and the things around him. So Gary Winogrand is going up, God, this is really a long, and down here are the other videos. I'm not gonna show you those today. I'm not sure when I will show you those, but um, I wanna show you his images here, the Polaroids. Okay, so as we look at these images, you know, much more contemporary, Dash Snow is working with a Polaroid camera. Can everybody see these images? I haven't screwed up again, have I? Everybody, you should You're see good. it. Okay, a guy in a wheelchair. All right, great. Okay, so Dash Snow, a couple of things. He's photographing in the 2000s. So you know, he's using a Polaroid camera, which even at that time is, is this sort, and it, you may not even know what a Polaroid camera is. A Polaroid camera is a camera that uses this pack of film that you put in and it, it was like kind of this little square box. But the thing about them was that you pressed the button, it took the image and then it went zzz, and this kind of square card came out the bottom and you waited for about a minute and the image appeared. It would be across the bottom here in this white zone was chemical that as the, as the camera rolled it out, that chemical would be spread across the image and it would develop it. Okay. There are digital cameras at the time that he's photographing. Uh, what made a Polaroid so important in its day was that it was an immediate photograph. Pre-digital camera, you had no way of, of getting an a quick image because you'd shoot on film, you'd have to go process it, make a print, all that kind of stuff, very time consuming. Polaroid was a way to get a quick image. The thing with the Polaroid camera was that, uh, one, it had a specific look. Two, there are no negatives with it. It is a unique image. It comes out, it's a one-shot deal. That's the only one. It also comes out immediately and you can pass it around. It's a, it's a physical, tangible object. Unlike a digital camera where the image may come up and you can show it to other people and maybe even drop it to other people's phones and stuff. The Polaroid was this, this tactile thing that you could hold, that you could show people that would lay around. So you could have a stack of them, you could move them. So they became an object of their own. All right. Why do I say that? Because as we move on, but you know, come on, a lot of his images are just things that are, are kind of funny, interesting, uh, a different sort of lifestyle. You know, Dash Snow is, is part of a group of artists that are out, you know, he's living in New York and sort of, uh, I forget exactly where, whether it's Greenwich or Soho or, or anyways, but they're, they're, he's hanging out with a group of artistic people, you know, that's what they're doing. They're the, either they're visual artists, painters, you know, painting, drawing, or they're dance people, but they're all somehow in the creative arts and, and stuff like that. Street artists, all sorts of, you know, and well, there's just the range of people sort of, I want to, I keep wanting to make references of stuff that I haven't told you, but like Andy Warhol did the same sort of thing. He surrounded himself with creative people, which were often all 
also kind of scary and lived on the fringes of society and all of that sort of stuff comes along with that. So, you know, come on, this is just kind of funny. A guy in his wheelchair with his broken leg or whatever, and he's still tagging a, a barricade. This photograph here, I mean, you know, here is a guy leaning over a rail throwing up and, and that is just sort of disgusting on its own. But what makes this photograph is this guy here leaning over his shoulder, just laughing at him. There's no empathy. There's no feeling bad for this guy. There's no trying to help him. He doesn't even look that, you know, it just looks like he's possessed by some kind of demonic thing coming out of him. I just have always liked this photograph. You know, come on, that's just funny. I love you, mom. But again, going back to the idea of the Polaroid, you know, the ability to ride on it the fact that it gets passed around and other people are looking at it, you know, to be able to scratch into the surface of it, to, to do different things with it. You know, my guess is he wanted to photograph this woman and she didn't like it, you know, but come on, I love you, mom, just makes it funnier. Um, you know, so that's what he's photographing. He's photographing his daily life. I don't know if it's in the video or, or what I put there for you. Um, Dash Snow, like I said, was involved with this this group of people who led sort of this outside life, a lot of sex, drugs, rock and roll. You know, we'll spend some time talking about why as human beings are we attracted to the sort of the darker side of the world, you know, to the sex, drugs and rock and roll part, especially when you're living it. Um, you know, Dash Snow is an interesting character because he came from a family, probably one of the wealthiest families in the United States, if not in the world, uh, who were also big art, uh, collectors and patrons. Um, you know, his grandmother, what's her name? Manil, the Manils, um, just huge amounts of money. They are responsible for the Dia Art Foundation and the Manil Collection in New York. Um, so Dash Snow came from a lot of money, but he chose to lead a sort of more bohemian outsider poor artist lifestyle. He surrounded himself with those people and he sort of lived like that. Again, a lot of sex, drugs, rock and roll. And that's what he's photographing. Now, we could talk about the fact that since he came from a very wealthy family, while they say they disowned him, his grandmother would send him money and nobody really knew how much um, he was getting. Um, but there's this thing that sometimes is called cultural tourism, where people with money or means uh, choose to hang out or live a lifestyle comparable to people who don't have much money, you know, um, to sort of lead this lowbrow life where you come from a very highbrow background. And I refer to it as cultural tourism because the thing is, it's like being a tourist. It's like I went to Japan, not this last year, but the year before. And I got to go and see what Japan was like. I got to sit in Japanese bars and eat Japanese food and hang out with Japanese people and go to Japanese shopping malls and ride on the Japanese trains and lead a life similar to somebody living in Japan. The thing was, I didn't live in Japan. I always could go back home to my house in the United States. If I didn't like what it was like to be Japanese, I could come back. And so that's, that's what being a tourist is. You go and you kind of experience it, but that's not your real life. So Dash Snow is living and leading this life, this sort of lowbrow life where his wealthy family has sort of disowned him although he has his grandmother giving him money. But the question becomes, he always had that wealthy family to fall back on. He always had a safety net. If at any moment he's like, you know, I can't take the drugs, I can't, you know, I need help. Would his family have taken him back? Probably a pretty good chance that they would have put him into rehab. You know, he could go off and live this fairly, higher class life. And so, you know, the question in that becomes how much of this is for, you know, why, what, what is the purpose of somebody doing this? 
Now, Dashno says with his photographs that he started using the Polaroid camera because he would get so drunk or stoned or high or whatever, he would be, that he would black out, pass out at some point during the night. And that without the photographs, he wouldn't remember what he did the day before. Hmm. Kind of an interesting take on why you would then photograph things because you would go, oh yeah, I did that. Oh yeah, I did that. And okay, kind of an interesting practice. You know, I'm, I am getting so wasted every day. I don't remember my day. These are the images that are basically a document of what I did that day. I find that approach kind of fascinating. Um, and that's one of the reasons why I think his images are kind of interesting. Um, you know, now, will these images stand the test of time? You know, images like this just feel very exploitive to me. You know, it's schadenfreude uh, taking pleasure in somebody else's downfall. It's why I don't generally like photos of, of homeless people or people on the streets or, or things like that because they feel exploitive. Why are you doing it? What is, the, what is your goal? Are you gonna sell these and make money? Are you hoping to show that you're just so much better than these people? You know, what is, what is behind making those photographs? Um, and, and, you know, I look at these photographs and they remind me of watching Jackass. And I really had this love hate thing with Jackass because there are things that I just thought were hilarious in Jackass. And there are other things that I just, thought this is the worst thing anybody could do. One, the one that hits me, that sticks with me every, every time I talk about Jackass is when Johnny Knoxville dressed up like an old man in a wheelchair and he went down uh, over here, Bunker Hill in Los Angeles, and, you know, down, downhill as if he was out of control. And people would drop their groceries and they'd run to try to help him and blah, blah. And it was all done at their expense. You know, he was playing Praying, praying, P E R Y I N G, praying on people's desire to be helpful, to be a good person. And, and, you know, even though I'm kind of an ass, I desire to be a good person. If I saw an old man out of control on a wheelchair, I would drop whatever I was doing to go over and try to help him. And I would drop my eggs or I would, you know, I could drop my camera. Who knows what I. And then when I found out it was just Johnny Knoxville dressed up like an old man. It, it would so piss me off. Now, some of the people thought it was funny. I don't know. I would be so pissed off that he was exploiting my sense of humanity or whatever. And, and so that sort of comes up in these photographs. Like, why are you taking these? Especially somebody who has the ability to lead such a privileged lifestyle, who's choosing not to, but then making fun of, of people or, or, you know, I. So Diane Arbus is photographing people on the fringes of society, but in a very empathetic way. She's engaging them. She's, and you can tell from her photographs that it's really, she's, she's kind of enamored by these people she's photographing, these people who don't fit in, that are leading their lives. And, and they're shot in almost this heroic way. The people that she photographs who are well-off privilege don't look good in their photographs. You know, the people who the midgets, the people at nudist colonies <coughs> are given a far better look in their images. So, you know, we, we look at images in that way. What, what is, or at least I do, um, I'm gonna talk about that in that way. If you have something else to say, please type it in, yell it out, whatever. But I'm telling you how, how I look at images and how I think about them and, and not just the image itself, but how it got there, how it got made, what, what it's being used for, you know, I showed you the prices of Ansel Adams photographs now. You know, Dash Snow is interesting also in that how somebody, a gallerist, was able to take his photographs and monetize them. And to me, that, that is an interesting take on, on the art market. I ran an art gallery for 10 years. I'm very engaged in the art market. You know, we went to the art fairs, we sold artist work, we put it in art collections, all of that kind of stuff. And, you know, when I, I became very jaded from the art market because it's not always just about the best work. And, and we'll talk more about that. But let's go through these images a little bit more. You know, paying attention to things like this fear of the darkness and you just see somebody, you know, God knows what that is in the street and them laid out. You know, so, 
some of these images are are just kind of interesting image, you know, born to die and sex tattooed and not good tattoos, you know, but somebody felt the need to do that. But he's standing here in the in the cereal aisle and you have, you know, the cornflakes uh, rooster over his shoulder and the Nestle's quick rabbit, you know, looking at him, you know, so it's those little things. This again, when I talk about the, you know, somebody going through some, you know, I don't know whether she's worked a 12 hour day and is just falling asleep. She's so tired. She may be on heroin. Maybe she's on the nod. I don't know what it is, but it still doesn't give this guy the right to sort of go through her purse, you know, and, and even think that he's funny for doing it and, but hiding his face. So he's not, you know, all of those things coming together. Um, you know, the question of, of how a camera changes people's interactions, you know, if they didn't know they were being photographed, would they be engaging in this? Probably, you know, I, this is the riots and I think this is Chicago. Maybe it's LA, I don't know. Um, but, you know, the destruction, the vandalism, if it, if it wasn't being recorded, would people be as likely to engage in it or would they do as much of it? Um, you know, well, here's, you know, porn and sex. So sex and drugs right here. I don't, I don't see any rock and roll yet, but you just throw that in and, and this photo has it all. But somebody shooting up, you know, people snorting coke, being naked, straight, gay, all that sort of stuff going on in his images. Um, you know, but about this sort of lifestyle, leading these sort of things. And again, most people, oh, this is just one of my favorite photographs, just that, hell, come on. It's fairly fortunate that the S is, is you know, not showing up and it's just hell at night, just a good photograph. Um, <clears throat> you know, I don't know what happened here. I'm hoping somebody put red paint in his hand while he was asleep and you do that thing where you're like, oh, you wake up and you wipe your face. I hope that it's not, well, I don't hope, I don't care. It could be blood. I am not sure what's happened to him. Um, but it is an interesting photograph because of that, I'm not sure what's happened to him. Um, so as you go through the, you know, this photo, just, I mean, what is this kid? Maybe 13, 14 years old with a cigarette hanging out of his mouth. I mean, here I'm making the connection. I don't know. I'm guessing this is his dad. You know, is this the greatest dad in the world or is this somebody who needs child protective services called on them? You know, to be 13 and 14 on the back of a motorcycle with a cigarette hanging out of your mouth and girls showing you their boobs. To some people that'd be the, oh, if I could only get that, other people, it's like, oh my God, this is the worst. This is just, this is just horrible. You know, where do you fall in that? But it's an interesting photograph. Um, so again, when we talk about, you know, photographs that stand the test of time, will Dash Snow, you know, again, when we talk about introducing a camera, would this guy be doing this if it weren't being photographed? I remember when my son first got his, his cell phone and he was probably 13, 14, something like that. And it was like, everything had to be videotaped. Everything had to be photographed. It, he wouldn't do things unless he was, photo you know, we have a swimming pool and one night he, he would go in the swimming pool during the day, but he never swam at night. And, and one time he got, oh, I'm going in the pool. And I was like, that's kind of odd, but it was all about taking photographs of being in the pool at night. I don't know why, I don't know what had happened that he wanted other people to know that he had a pool that he swam in at night, I'm not sure what, what he got from that, but the, but he went in, photographed himself, was in there for you know 10, 15 minutes, got out, and it was all just for the photographs. I have a niece who is scared of dogs, but she loves to post uh, Instagram photos of her near a dog as if she's a dog lover. And we all know she does not like dogs, but she wants this image of herself out. So people thinking about how photographs work, how if you see it enough, the image can defy the reality of the situation. I mean, my God, we just lived through a presidency where reality took a back seat to what people said or how you put it out. If you just kept saying it enough, it became real. So, you know, how do photographs function that? Photographs even have a more sort of resolute background. Evidence, photographs are used for evidence. If it's in a photograph, it must be real. You know, and those are the things we're starting to look at, to question, how did they get there? Why did they get there? Why are people doing it? Um, so all of those things come up in Dash Snow's photographs. 
You know, I, I've gone through a lot of stuff here. Now, again, I keep coming back to, are his photographs going to stand the test of time? Will they be considered interesting down the road? I don't know. I, I don't know. They're sort of on the line for me. It's not that he's doing something so amazingly new that opens up like other artists are like, oh my God, Dash Snow was doing this. Now I can, I can sort of follow that same path. He, he owes a lot to photographers, especially Diane Arbus who came before him, photographing people on the fringes of society. You know, um, art, we'll also see another artist named Nan Golden who does a very similar thing, but I think in a much more interesting way. So, you know, again, does it stand the test of time? Now I will go to the art market, Dash Snow, a gallerist, you know, at first Dash Snow was making these photographs and then somebody said, oh, you should show them. So because he was part of this sort of art community, people are like, oh, these are good, you should show them. So he started showing just the Polaroids taped to the wall or put up. And, you know, it's a Polaroid, it's four by four inches, something like that. Um, and, you know, if you sell that Polaroid, it's the unique thing. It's one of a kind. And he was selling them maybe for a hundred bucks, maybe, um, you know, and then once you sell it, that image, okay, you got a hundred bucks for it, you're done. Um, so a gallerist comes along and it's like, mm, well, I could sell these. Now with the gallerist involved, you have to give half to the gallery. That's the way it works. When I owned a gallery, if I sold a painting, the artist got half of what it sold for. I got half of what it sold for. Okay. So all of a sudden now, it becomes, how do you monetize this? So what the gallery did was, one, it can up the price of, of a Polaroid. So you can say, oh, it's gonna be $1,200 for that Polaroid, great. But that image is still only worth $1,200. Dash no gets six, the gallery gets six. But what the gallerist did was like, well, let's take these photographs and re-photograph them and then make them big. So you take, for a couple of reasons. One is, so you take this photograph, you re-photograph, maybe not this one, it's not a great one. Um, come on, the rat running across the street. Uh, you take this photograph, come on, an Asian gangster showing you his gun, and you make it big. Let's just say, now well, that's kind of a gross one. Well, let me find one that I like. See, in the, the more I look, okay. So this one here, Frank snorting your name in, in what I'm guessing is Coke. That's expensive. I don't know who got the money to do that. Uh, hopefully it's somebody's birthday, I don't know. But let's say you, your name's Frank and you like this image Ugh, to be snorting my name and coat. I want to buy this image. So again, if Polaroid, maybe you pay $1,200 for it. Okay, fine. But it's still just this little thing. Even if you frame it, it's only this big. So this gallerist took them, re-photographed them and had them printed out still with the white borders and everything to look like big Polaroids, like 30 by 40 inches. One, they're bigger. So all of a sudden they seem more valuable, they're worth more just because they're bigger. That doesn't necessarily make that image any better or worth more. It's just, it's a bigger object to sell. Um, also now you, you print them in addition. So let's say you make it 30 by 40 and now it becomes a $3,000 photograph because it's big. Now you go, okay, well, I'm also gonna make this an addition of 10. So now you have, if you're selling them for 3000, now you have an addition of 10. If you sell all 10, that's $30,000. That image now goes from being maybe a $1,200 image to a $30,000 image just by the presentation. It also becomes a $3,000 single image because people with $3,000 to spend on this photograph want something that's gonna take up some space on their wall. They may want two or three of them. They may want, you know, because, uh, you know, all of a sudden you have people like me who you know had this sort of kind of you felt sort of rebellious and punk rock when you were younger and you kind of like the idea that you're still holding on to that but your surroundings sort of deny that you're making money you have a job you, you have nicer things you know the worst thing i ever happened to me was henry rollins was one of my idols you know black flag when i was in my younger days and uh i got older and i i went to see henry rollins uh, at, at something. And he did this whole talk about how he'd gotten older and how he'd got a futon and how he got curtains in his place. And I just thought, you know, Henry, you were the guy who was supposed to hold on to punk rock for us. So, you know, it's that thing is, as things change, but the people with money, you know, still want to be seen in a certain way. And so, um, 
you know, somebody like me might go buy a group of three of these Dash Snow photographs to put on my hallway. So as people walk in, not only they go, oh, Dash Snow, yeah, controversial figure. I see, wow, that you're doing, okay, you're going with that guy. And, oh, that is so, that is so rock and roll. That is so punk rock of you, you know? Oh, yeah, these, these images are not pretty. Yeah, oh, that's, de you know, so all of those things that come along with it. Um, this photograph, just, just hilarious. I mean, yeah, okay, you have a blow up doll because uh, you want to drive in the what a high occupancy lane. Okay, I don't know this, but I've been told finding a male blow up doll is pretty difficult. Uh, but you know, the guy just sort of laughing with it there. I mean, that is just a funny photograph. And you know, when I say, will his images stand the test of time? Well, he's part of the art market. He died, which then increased the value of all of his work. Um, I don't know how much, how big a part of the art market he is now, but when his images come up, if they sell at auction for more, then that increases the value of all your other work. So the art market takes this toll or can put you into things. But also, you know, it is that thing as you go back and look at the images, are they, do they resonate now? I will, I would argue that you can go back and look at Diane Arbus photographs and those are still interesting, as interesting today as the day she took them, at least to me. The Dash Snow photographs, the more I show them, the less interesting they are to me. Does he seem to have much influence on the next generation of artists or the next generation of artists? Maybe not. If he hadn't died so young, would he have? Possibly, but I don't know. He died fairly young. Um, so all of those things come together as to, you know, are these in, images interesting in this moment? Will they be interesting five years from now? Will they be interesting, you know, two decades from now? You know, will artists go back and go, oh, because of Dash Snow, because of what he was doing, yeah, it made me think about image making in this way or do something differently. I, I would tend to argue now that that's not going to be the case, that Dash Snow will probably fall by the wayside. But what I want you people to get from it now is that your subject matter can be anything. It can be the things around you. you. You know, and even if you're not leading a sex, drugs, and rock and roll life, those things that are happening around you are interesting. You're engaged in them. You're choosing to do things. You know, why? What is it that you like or don't like about them? Make images that, that show that. Um, you know, so again, you can approach this street photo assignment as an outsider going out finding a group of people and photographing that maybe you're interested we're going to see boogie who did just that he was interested in in homeless people but he didn't go photograph them as homeless people and he ended up phoning them shooting up drugs and being part of their life and we'll we'll look at the footwork of boogie uh he also then went to the projects and and started photographing gang members he wasn't a gang member he was interested in what they were interested in. Like, so he sort of took it as a vicarious sort of way. Oh, let me see what that's like to be that thing. And I will take my camera and I will photograph those things to sort of make that more apparent. So you can approach work like that, or you can approach it more as an insight. Or, or, or let's go back. Gary Winogrand mentioned Robert Frank. Robert Frank did a book called The Americans. Uh, I'm probably not gonna show you that. He's a very important photographer history of photo. But Robert Frank was Swiss. He came from Switzerland, or was he Swedish? I don't know, one of the SW ones. Came here as somebody not part of American culture and started photographing American culture because it was different than his, like these things that we do that we take for granted. He was making photographs of that, like, isn't that odd? You know, if, if you were to go, if when I went to Japan, isn't it odd that this is how people I don't know if you could hear that. That was something really weird. But isn't it odd that people uh, do this in a restaurant or they eat this food or they all get together and this is how they act on a train or, you know, things that, that we don't normally do. You know, the different, different cultural things that take place there. He came to the United States and started photographing American culture. It's like, wow, this is weird black people and white people separate. Oh, this is weird. 
men do this, women do this. Oh, this is weird. There's cowboys and there's people in suit, you know, like these things that, that we just sort of gloss over in our day-to-day -day life. And that's what happens in your house. You know, you are used to living or seeing, or, you know, it, let me put it this way. The goldfish in the bowl doesn't notice the water, but we're like, how do you live in water? How do you breathe? How do you do all these things? Because it's foreign to us. But the goldfish is just doing what he normally does. So interesting photographs are when you're able to say, oh, I live in water. Wow, this is kind of interesting. Hmm, look at those people. They don't live in the water, you know, and to make that visual. So that's, I'm all over the place right now. But what I want you to understand is think about how you're making your photographs. Are you an outsider coming in, looking at that? Or are you somebody from the inside? Maybe you're part of a band. And, and what, it's, what is it like to be in that band? What are the things people don't know? They only see you up on the stage playing music. They don't get how much work you have to put in for practice, the fights that go on. They don't get what it's like to have to get in a van and drive somewhere and to have people break things. And you know, to go in and, and maybe play to an audience of three people one night and to a hundred the other the next night. You know, so what is that like? How do you make images of that? As opposed to just photographs of you guys up on the stage, you know, is it from behind the scenes? What, it, what is it like to go on the stage? What is it like to look out in that sea of people? So those are the kinds of things I'd like you to start thinking about with your photographs for this street fight assignment, especially. What is it you're trying to show? What are the, what are you trying to do? We'll see Nan Golden here probably next week. And, you know, for her, it's about documenting the life that she led. So similar to Dash Snow, but a little bit different. And, you know, for her, she won't move a beer bottle. You know, she says, I will not move a beer bottle or anything. It has to be way, the way it is so that nobody can come back five years from now and go, oh, no, we didn't do that. Oh, no, it wasn't that bad or whatever it was that she has a photograph to go, no. This is what was happening. So again, I spent a lot of time on that. That's a lot of thoughts, a lot of stuff going on in there and probably too much for you to listen to today, but I will, I will hit these same themes over and over again. Okay, I sort of worn myself out. Um, I think that's about all I have for you today. Does anybody have any questions or comments before I, I stop the recording? Anything that you think other people may want to know or something I glossed over or come back to. Okay, then let me stop the recording.